Uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, I'm assuming everyone can see my screen. Uh, right. So, hey. so file format. How do you go to full screen? I don't really use PowerPoint. I use the Mac version. Enter full screen. There we go. There we go. Oh no, that's just full screen. Uh, uh, on the. But where's uh, just play? Design to, to, to the right, to the right, there's this tab called slideshow. Slideshow, I should play from start. Right, here we go. Okay, um, okay yeah, so um, yeah, apology, firstly, apologies. Uh, this was supposed to be given by my close colleague, John Ojal, um, who has been working closely with our colleagues, Stacey Arangi and uh, Camelina Lendo at the Kemri World Contrast Center. Um, in Khalifi in Kenya. Um, I've stepped in because uh, he's his car is broken down and basically there is no internet where he lives in Kenya. Uh, so I've managed to get a WhatsApp call. Um, but I didn't manage to get any of his slides because I've been working 100% on Omicron. So what I'm, I've put together some stuff we've been putting into a draft paper that we've put together on uh, vaccination. So I'm going to talk through, I'm, I'm first going to try and quickly, but I think uh, quick, I'm trying to be quick because uh, this um, this uh, session has a focus on vaccines, but I'm going to quickly go through how we're modelling in Kenya because it's possibly slightly different to how COVID is modelled um, elsewhere in the world or you, we use slightly different data sets. It's not that that different, but it's probably worth going through. Um, obviously, with vaccinations, uh, a target um, outcome is to reduce uh, severe outcomes. Um, and it's extremely actually quite extremely difficult to measure what the severe outcomes in Kenya have been. Um, and so it's kind of interesting to talk through how we're trying to model that or how we're trying to make inferences on what the severe outcomes have been. Um, and then we'll talk about how we're modeling the vaccines. And then I'm going to talk about where the vaccine program in Kenya is at the moment. Um, what I believe are some critical features around the age structure and how the vaccine rollout is going and the speed of the vaccine rollout. Um, and then finally, I've been uh, I've been um, pretty much 100% um, Omicron. Um, um, and you're going to see that we kind of anticipated Omicron, um, but that doesn't mean it hasn't been a lot of work trying to work out what we think will happen in Kenya. So I'm going to share some early findings because it would be interesting to open that out uh, and talk about where I think vaccines have helped, um, are already helping a lot. Uh, okay, cool. Yeah, so um, this, uh, because I had to put this together very quickly, because I only found out a short while ago um, that I couldn't get uh, John's slides for this. It's built on top of a Comort presentation. Now, Comort is kind of like um, the Kenyan equivalent of mashing together SPIM and SAGE. Uh, and what we do is we regularly go on and we talk about what our near term forecasts are in Kenya. And um, we look at how that's doing against the most recent data. So we sort of um, talk through where the models are going, what's wrong with them, and uh, compare our near-term forecasts against the actuals um, in an attempt to improve them. So there's going to be some of that stuff that I've left in there. I hope that doesn't dilute the talk too much. I, As I said, I already apologize in advance because it's going to be a little bit zanier than I would have hoped. Um, the basic model, uh, is very familiar to everyone, so I can almost skip over this. The one thing I want to highlight is that um, um, in a lot of the modeling um, that uses a very similar structure to this, I almost don't need to explain it, um, outside of uh, Kenya, the actual data that is used to infer model parameters is the outcomes model. So it is things like people, the instance rate into hospitals, the instance rate into ICUs, um, and deaths, obviously. Uh, all of those severe outcomes are actually incredibly haphazardly sampled in Kenya for all sorts of reasons. Um, and so we actually don't use them to fit the model. We use uh, other data that I'm going to look at in the next slide. But what we do is we do a semi out of sample comparison to the data that is now becoming available for the first time um, in the last six months or so. 
uh, about these like severe outcomes. Um, and the idea will be that we're fitting the model on other data sources. And then because we've inferred an infection curve, we can then link the infection curve to the severe outcome data that we do actually have. And so then you have a smaller set of parameters, which are essentially things like the IFR, but age structure of the IFR, um, the hospitalization rate per county, uh, per infection, uh, and that kind of thing. And then we can compare that to the severe outcomes that we have. And obviously, if, one, if one's going one direction and the model's saying it should be going in the other direction, we've got a major problem. Thankfully, that hasn't happened, but that's how we've been using it. And possibly the other thing that I need to note in this is this so-called W class in the bottom right hand. Uh, so, we, so we use that for uh, waned immunity. Um, um, and so in the waned immunity category, uh, we assume actually quite a reasonably fast rate of leaving complete immunity from COVID to a state, uh, so typically on average six months, although we've done quite a lot of sensitivity around that. Um, and um, then uh, you uh, sort of transition to having quite high protection. and We fit the uh, amount of protection you have long term against uh, sort of um, reinfection studies. Um, and that will have some consequences later on when we look at Omicron, if we get time to do that. Uh, yeah, so, so the data we actually fit to uh, is the, um, the proportion PCR positive negative and the proportion serology positive and negative. So the serology has issues in that most of the longitudinal time series we have on serology come in these like discrete time things where they do, where they basically go around and they look at blood donors. Now, everyone here will know that blood donors are a biased sample of the um, serology, but um, unfortunately that's the main thing we have <laughs> in Kenya. And the PCR positive negative is obviously an extremely biased sample of uh, the real underlying piece, uh, positive negative rate in the population. So what we, what we do is we basically trust the serology a bit more and we fit we infer um, a kind of biasing parameter, which tries to link um, the observed PCR positivity in each county to um, uh, what we believe the true PCR positivity in each county is. Um, and the re what we are essentially doing is we have these like discrete times where we get quite a lot of serology data, and then we use the PCR uh, positivity to kind of interpolate between those periods and then to compare then where we have deaths so we've always had death results but deaths are incredibly undersampled in kenya uh, but no one knows how undersampled and we'll maybe get a chance to talk about that um uh so we've always compared about like so if we're making a prediction about what the daily infections are from back inferring from these two main data sets in the in the blue section um then we can also fit an ifr an effective ifr so it's like what's your chance of dying if you're infected and crucially ending up in the data sets that we have which is a big <laughs> which is an unknown um factor which really differentiates modeling kenya from say modeling the uk um but we can at least like compare what the trends look like uh and if we believe it should be trend down and the deaths are trend up we know the model's gone wrong uh, that has never happened but it's something we look out for. And then recently we've been getting a lot more data about ICU occupancy and ward hospital occupancy because it's it's taken this long to get those systems going in Kenya. Um, I can talk about this a lot, but that's not really the focus. Uh, probably the only other thing to mention is that as well as this sort of age breakdown thing, we have a social structure breakdown thing. Um, and that's really critical in Kenya. Like it's true everywhere, but it's really, really true in Kenya where you have um, cities like Nairobi, which have a very high percentage of people who live in informal dwellings, and those people need to be modeled differently from the general population, uh, or rather they're part of the general population. Um, so this is some stuff that got left over from my presentation to Comort. So this is updating some stuff we did, uh, and me and John published in Science um, a, a month or two or three ago, like time flies in the land of COVID. Um, and so you can see that we get these these discrete periods where we get like data dumps about what the uh, seropositivity is. And each time we get a new data dump, we basically start fitting the model on all the previous 
um, serology estimates, apart from the most recent one, which we use as out of sample validation for the model, because basically we don't trust any, any of the data in Kenya at all. So we do as much out of sample validation as we can without destroying the predictive power of the model itself. Um, yeah, so the main focus of the last COMOP meet, uh, of the COMOP meeting that this talk was presented for was actually to what extent tri um, relaxing um, MPIs in Kenya would trigger um, an increase in infections. And basically, uh, by fitting when counties, different counties in Kenya were starting to surge up in cases, we could back interpolate when we thought um, variants were getting in. Um, and so that's one explanation for why infections would go out up. The other explanations being like, um, say, rela relaxing the curfew a bit uh, or reopening bars. And so when we link it, link it up, basically um, the um, surges in infections that we were observing in Kenya seem to be pretty much completely explained by variant frequency, uh, which meant that in, in the science paper I mentioned, our kind of conclusion was um, back in June that if we were going to get more waves in Kenya, it wouldn't be due to um, relaxing the few MPIs that they had left, uh, so long as there was re still reasonable mass, mass user, usage. Um, it would be if we had either a really much more transmissible variant that was like at least 50% more transmissible than alpha or beta, uh, both of which got into Kenya in different parts of Kenya. Um, but at the same time, so they were hard to differentiate from purely from fitting when cases went up. Um, and um, or and or so either a much more transmissible variant or a variant that could uh, substantially avoid uh, prior immunity. And now, of course, we've had both. Um, so the first one happened, that was Delta. Uh, so this was comparing what the model predicted the, the, the frequency should be simply by backtracing how much the case rate had gone up uh, against the only part of Kenya where we have like pretty reasonable uh, variant frequency data. So this is from about like N equals 600. I should have put that in the plot title. Um, and then blue is the old, old strains. And then I've elided alpha and beta. It was mainly alpha in Nairobi. Um, and then uh, Delta, and you can see like the model pretty much lines up with the data, which means that uh, the variants themselves were a sufficient explanation, um, um, which meant that the risk going forwards in Kenya is new variants, new, new variants. Um, and we'll get to that. Um, I can probably skip this quite for uh, like, so in every cohort meeting, we try and do a last time we had some data. So we, we don't get the data daily or weekly or anything. <laughs> that would be amazing. No, we, we still get lineless dumps every month or two. Um, and uh, so what we do is we make a reasonably moderate term forecast on each lineless dump. And then when we have another meeting, when we get another one, we compare how well the model did. And if it did really badly, we try and talk about why that why that happened. Um, so you, that's not super relevant for this talk, um, but it was doing okay. Well, one thing that um, maybe is interesting is that, um, that, that uh, now that we have rapid antigen tests in Kenya, uh, it sort of changes the uh, predicting the case curve quite a lot. Um, right, okay. So like I said, we started to get some data from the Ministry of Health because what they managed to do is they were all managed to organize people doing counts, just like quick head counts of uh, people in different ICU wards. And they found they found a way to basically chuck that into the ring. Um, so the data that had been, we had been getting uh, was essentially direct from the main testing labs in Kenya. So what we were getting were uh, big spreadsheets of test outcomes. And so obviously we were trying to uh, and they um, weeding them out so we weren't looking at tests, you know, if someone was first test, second test, uh, trying to weed it out so it was individuals that were tested rather than tests. Um, and um, there was some metadata about like the, uh, the county of origin of the test, uh, usually the age, but not always. Uh, and then a whole bunch of columns which were largely empty. So there was a lot of missing metadata from the test data. Uh, and the same for the serology samples. Um, and this was very hard to link to severe outcomes. 
So ultimately, they managed to just get people to do head counts and then chuck in the head counts. But those head counts are also lacking a lot of metadata. So uh, and, and a lot of people move from outlying counties into central counties. So it, it's it's hard to get a spread breakdown of like which counties are having like the hospitalization rates go up. So this this is like a Kenyan national picture. But by fitting the model to all this other data and then just going like, look, if we believe this infection curve and we um, can we link this in some way to the ICU occupancies and the variant frequencies, because we know that uh, different variants um, uh, have a different propensity to cause severe disease. Uh, and it was reasonable. And this this was one of the ones, this is only uh, the plot that I'm showing, but we, we basically started doing this in about July and we just kept on going like, right, well, we really don't trust this because the data is so shonky. So we, we're going to continuously look. You can see I'm chunk, chucking uh, a few months ahead data points. And you can see this is not that regularly sampled either. Um, but um, we, we felt that the out of sample accuracy showed that the model was at least capturing something uh, that was reasonable because this is the main thing the policymakers in Kenya want to know, but it's taken a very long time to get this data. Um, so the question, uh, and then this is, this is probably a more technical thing about like the reported oxygen usage used to only track ICU occupancy. Um, and then recently, I think as they've got more oxygen supply, they've deployed it to more people, which is probably changing the survivability rate, but in a way that we're not powered to detect yet with the data in Kenya. Um, uh, and this is us trying to like work out what demand, where demand will go. This is quite important because uh, when we first looked at this in February 2020, only 55% of beds in Kenya had access to oxygen, uh, which is extremely critical. I probably don't need to explain that. Um, and so a lot of what we are asked to do is project oxygen demand. But um, and finally, we, we're doing that reasonably um, because they need to move that around. Um, and they need to order it as well. Um, yeah. Okay. So on a talk mainly that should have been mainly about vaccines, I finally got to the vaccine. So I hope there is time to do this justice. Right. So the current situation in Kenya is that about six percent of the population, as of uh, last week, had been double vaxxed and had two weeks for the vaccination to reach its maximum efficacy. Um, so some useful breakdowns, I believe useful breakdowns of the age structure of Kenya. So this is a, so this is like a uh, upper, to upper tail distribution um, curve of uh, the Kenyan population. Um, so this, the top left plot is what percentage of people are younger than a certain age. So you see the median, the median person in Kenya is in this 15 to 19 year old age group. Um, and the top 6% are older than 60. So, so basically you hit get into the top 6% when you get to about 58, 59. Um, and that, that's the 6% coverage. So uh, I actually quickly changed this from optimal to very likely to be optimal because I was in a talk of, uh, of determining truly optimal strategies. In light of Omicron, I think it's safe to say oldest versus actually optimal. Um, um, and so um, the uh, top six, so we're basically above this age, if the Kenyans have managed to achieve an optimal strategy, which they probably haven't, um, uh, but if you manage to start with the oldest people and work downwards, you've basically got this age break, you've basically got nearly everyone above 60. Um, and unsurprisingly, those are the people that uh, are at the highest risk of death, as far as we know. So, um, oops. Oh. So the um, what we, what we found when when we have had managed to get uh, randomized properly randomized ser serological trials, uh, the risk of death for being over sixty th there aren't that many over sixty year olds. So they basically lumped all the over sixty year olds together. So we don't have fine resolution in the over sixty year olds. Um, but that risk, the relative risk, is is much much higher. It's like five times higher. Um, than 55 to 59 year olds, um, which I guess isn't that surprising. Um, it, yeah, it's a very steep increase. Um, the actual risk of death, so rather than relative, we fit county by county because we're also essentially absorbing uh, the detection rate in there. Um, so we are gonna compare to detected deaths and we're very sensitive to the fact that the actual deaths could be and probably are much, much higher. Um, 
Um, the hosp because the data I showed you about hospitalizations, they haven't managed to get age cross breaks in there. We've had to do the same, when we do the same thing for hospitalization risk, we've had to default back to data from outside Kenya, which may or may not be reliable. But you can see that actually the hospitalization risk as reported in the classic or the modern classic Merity 2020 uh, Lancet paper um, is obviously going up with age, but it's a much smoother transition than what we're seeing in terms of deaths. Um, so we ummed and ahed about whether we should do that or, or, or use the risk of death as a proxy for risk of hospitalization. And we went with this. Um, Five um, minutes now. Oh, good. <laughs> anyway, and unsurprisingly, more than 50% of the people that have died are in this 6% uh, of people in Kenya uh, who are 60 or above. Um, yeah, so um, in the modeling framework, we've done uh, quite a lot of stuff that I think is like pretty classic now. So there's like you, the three main efficacious measures are against disease, acquisition and transmission. And this is all uh, mainly AZ against, uh, this is AZ against Delta. Um, and the scenarios we break up at are uh, like, what coverages can we get to by June next year? So that's 30, 50, 70, it's looking like 30, unfortunately. Um, uh, can we speed this up? So basically this rapid scenario versus not rapid. Um, and then critically, we were like, the only thing, the thing that will bust Kenya, be big, big problems is an immune evasion uh, variant of a, at least about 50% immune evasion. So we were looking at like, what if we had a 50% evasion against um, transmission <laughs> uh, variant emerge, uh, which happened? Uh, it seems that that actually did happen. Um, so, or is happening uh, currently because the, the case is starting to go vertical in Kenya. Uh, we're seeing bad early indications. So what we what we mainly find with this is if we don't get a variant, you get kind of low numbers of deaths, very low, pretty low numbers of deaths. Um, and the number of things have uh, averted over time, this is compared to a baseline of no, of zero coverage, go up and up and up. Um, and then with a variant, what you get is if you've been vaccinating, if this variant comes in at the end of the year, which it appears to have done, um, then you uh, get a big, aver you get a relatively big aversion in deaths and critical cases. And now you could say like, like how on earth can that be reasonably good given how low the coverage is? And it's because of the age distribution. If, if you've managed to get the oldest people first in Kenya, actually 6% double vax coverage is already hopefully and probably doing a lot of good because it's that top 6% of the population that are by far most at risk. And I think concepts around um, reducing um, transmission through herd immunity are unlikely to be effective from what we know early days about Omicron. Um, and therefore this age-based targeting is really being critical and we may in Kenya have already dodged a bit of a bullet um, by getting to 6%, um, which sounds crazy when we're talking in, in, in the UK, like where we have like over 70% coverage and we need to get uh, boosters ASAP. But in Kenya, it may be reasonable. And also we haven't explicitly, this is the fast rollout and you just get more benefit as you'd expect. Um, we haven't explicitly put in waning effectiveness against vaccines, but again, because of a lot of the people who are getting vaccinated have been vaccinated quite recently, um, that probably isn't as critical an issue in Kenya. Although if you, if any, for any HIC wants to give us boosters, that would be amazing. Thank you very much. Um, maybe I don't have time for on the cron actually. Uh, that, that's really like hot off the press stuff. So maybe I'll stop there. Um, yeah, and take questions. Thank you, thank you, Sam, and thanks again for giving the talk at Oops, such late notice different. and putting together that at such late notice. That was yeah. There we go. A very, very helpful over insight into the situation in Kenya. So mm. we've got time for a couple of minutes for questions. So 